Welcome to the CCNA Candidate Forum. My name is Lou Costa, President of CCNA. The mission of our organization is to preserve, protect, and enhance city neighborhoods. Therefore, many of our questions will be directed toward neighborhood issues. Mr. Batte from District 1, if that is the correct pronunciation, could not attend due to other commitments. Mr. Royal and his wife had a baby last night and he has had no sleep and he's uh, on the phone right now. We congratulate Eric and his wife on their new baby girl. We would like to thank the candidates for joining us today from District 1, Willie Shaw, District 2, Liz Albert and Terry Turner, District 3, Eric Arroyo and Dan Claremont. We appreciate our co-sponsor, the law firm of Shoemaker, Kendrick and Loop for providing the forum technology platform. At this point, I would like to introduce Dan DeLeo who, who is a partner in the firm to share a few comments. Mr. DeLeo. Thanks, Lou, I appreciate it. Good morning, everybody. I'm Dan DeLeo. I'm an attorney at Shoemaker, Loop and Kendrick and I'm a board certified business litigator. Shoemaker is a full service law firm that has offices in six states. We have 150 lawyers in the state of Florida, including in Tampa and right here in Sarasota. Now I'm a business litigator, but I'm also the president of my neighborhood association. So I wanna thank CCNA, a terrific organization. And I wanna thank the candidates for putting your hats in the ring uh, and, and, and serving the public. We appreciate that. And without good public servants, we're all in trouble. So uh please everybody join me in welcoming our moderator david morris david's a member of ccna thank you thank you dan lou candidates and members of ccna i'm pleased to be your moderator so here are the basics we request that each candidate be respectful adhere to the time allotted and for each question we're following the code of conduct as presented at each city commission meeting and request to be followed here it is um, we may disagree but we will be respectful of one another. We will direct all comments to issues and we will not engage in personal attacks. The questions today were developed with input from 35 neighborhoods and the CCNA executive board. The questions were not shared with the candidates in advance. So the format of the forum will be as follows. Each candidate will have 90 seconds to introduce themselves. They will be asked questions and will have one minute to respond. There are a total of seven questions and at the conclusion of each round of questioning, each candidate will have 30 second rebuttal opportunity to correct or clarify the record if requested. So I'll ask, uh, hold up your hands if you want to do it. We'll do it in the order that you started. There will be a lightning round of four questions that will require a yes or no answer. The next round will be uh, to pose one question directed to each set of candidates by district with one minute to answer and no rebuttal. At the conclusion of questions, each candidate will have one minute for a closing statement and the order of candidates' response will be changing after every question. I'm assisted by a timekeeper and parliamentarian, Sue Stewart, who has a responsibility for ensuring the code of conduct is maintained and letting everybody know how much time they've got left. And also, please mute your audio when you're not speaking. Thank you. So we will begin uh, with candidate introductions, with starting with District 1 in alphabetical order. Mr. Shaw, please. Good morning. My name yeah. is Will. Okay, again, good morning. I'm Willis Alsa, Commissioner for District 1. I have uh, served the city of Sarasota for the last nine years in that position. I have chaired your MPO. I am presently the chair of the Metropolitan, I'm sorry, Southwest Regional Planning Council. I have chaired the Minnesota League of Cities. I am presently on the Sarasota Housing Authority's uh, board, and I am a very active member of uh, the National League of Cities where I sit on the board of Rio. At the state, I sit on the Municipal Administration um, Committee. And I have, like Mr. Arroyo, this has been a very busy week. I had a new grandson born on Monday and uh, we're all excited. We're number 25 and we're very, very happy to be here yet again. 
And I congratulate Mr. Arroyo and his wife. And I thank you, CCNA, for allowing me to be here this morning. Thank you Have so champ much. some champagne coming your way. <laughs> that sounds good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Alpert, could you please just introduce yourself? Good morning, and it must be a big baby month because I had a new granddaughter about two weeks ago. So September mm -hmm. apparently is a, bus a busy time for babies. Um, I want to thank CCNA for offering us this opportunity. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm Commissioner Liz Alpert, and I'm running for re-election to the Sarasota City Commission. Before I tell you why I'm running, I'd like to tell you a little bit about myself. I'm the oldest of eight children. My dad was a truck driver and my mother stayed home, of course, to take care of all of us. Due to my family's financial situation, I wasn't able to go to college after high school. So I started working and went to school when I, was a ch when I could and took a class or two at every opportunity. It took me nearly 20 years to get my undergraduate degree and raise three daughters, but I never stopped pursuing my dream. My ultimate goal was to become an attorney. I finally got that opportunity at age 54 and I took it. While in law school, I served on the city's human relations board, then served on the civil service personnel board until my election in 2015. I'm now a practicing family law and estate planning attorney in addition to my duties as a city commissioner. In the mid nineties, I served for six years on a board that oversaw two historic districts. During that time, I attended every National Trust for Historic Preservation convention I could, where I not only learned about the advantages of historic preservation, but also learned about best practices for urban planning. I developed a passion for smart growth principles. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Liz. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Turner, please. D Dan Go. <clears throat> I'm happy to go next. Good morning, and thank you. Yes, Pardon me? He's after you. Okay. Good morning and thank you. I'm Terry Turner. Uh, I was reared in Dayton, Ohio, where I met my wife, Nancy. We have two sons, two daughter-in-laws, and four wonderful grandchildren, all of them older than uh, Mr. Shaw's grand latest grandchild. For nearly 30 years, I worked in senior management roles at large U.S. corporations work experience which required leadership skills that are directly applicable to being an effective city commissioner. Since 1998, we have lived in Sarasota, where I have focused on protecting the environment and local politics. I am running for city commission for three primary reasons. The first reason is to be a voice on the commission for residents and neighborhoods, and to protect our neighborhoods from unwanted intrusion by developers and special interest groups. It's unfortunate that Commissioner Alpert has shown again and again that she will not protect our neighborhoods. The second reason uh, is to be a voice on the commission for prudent financial management. During Commissioner Alpert's five years, the city's annual budget has increased from 196 million to 256 million, an unsustainable unsustainable 31% increase. And the third reason is to encourage the commission to fulfill its leadership responsibilities, responsibilities that is currently abdicated. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Arroyo, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you all for having me at CCNA. I, um, my name is Eric Arroyo. I'm gonna give you the Spark Notes version of, of who I am. I'm, uh, I'm the first Hispanic to be a candidate for city commission in the history of Sarasota. Uh, I'm a first generation American. I came here when I was in high school, graduated from Riverview locally, met my wife at Riverview, and now I'm an attorney. I became the first to graduate high school in my family. My, my wife is a teacher at Sarasota High, and, uh, and we just had our first daughter last night at 8.55 p.m. And let me tell you, half, half British American, half Dominican kids are adorable. Um, so I, I practice wills and, and, and trusts and business law. I have a track record in the city of, of getting both sides uh, to agree, to agree. And let me tell you what I mean by that. It means I'm endorsed by Democrats and I'm endorsed by Republicans. It means that I'm endorsed by the Building Industry Association and I'm endorsed by Gulf Coast Builders Exchange. And I'm also endorsed by Control Growth Now. You know what that means? They both are completely aware that, that I have their endorsement. And it's because I have a track record of being in this city most of my life, 
getting both sides to collaborate and work together. And that's the type of leadership that I'm gonna bring to Sarasota City, especially with these times that we're living in and, and, and the struggles that we're going to be facing in the coming years. Uh, I'm Eric Arroyo, I'm, I'm uh, from Sarasota, I'm the person you know, I've been before the city commission many times and, uh, and I'd like your support in November. Fine. Thank you. Thank you. We we'll get started. Um, oh, Mr. Claremont. You forgot Dan. I'm sorry. I did. No, I'm sorry, Mr. Claremont. Happened Please before. Proceed. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, yes, I am Dan Claremont, and I'm running for City Commission of District Three. And uh, thank you to CCNA, and congratulations to Eric once again. Um, my wife Yvette and I have five children. We moved to the area ten years ago after buying property here originally six years ago, and I'm running. Primarily because of, uh, well, among many reasons, because of uh, in, uh, environmental infrastructure in the city, concern for uh, the ongoing strength of our arts and culture community, and also to bring dollars back to and enhance District 3, our infrastructure, our streets, our sidewalks, and our parks. You know, I know CCNA has not been meeting for the last several months uh, due to COVID, uh, but that doesn't mean they haven't helped me with my campaign. Um, Individually, I've worked with Marianne Bowie, who's been instrumental in helping me understand land use issues, zoning and planning issues in the city. Uh, Norm Dumain gave me a personalized tour of the watershed that makes uh, the Bobby Jones property so important and uh, explained to me and impressing upon me why it's so important that we protect it for the next 100 years as a conservancy. I also uh, spoke with Larry Silvermans, who uh, educated me on ill-advised housing plan over on Hatton Street. I signed the uh, petition against it, and eventually it was quashed because of the efforts of the neighborhood. And also Linda Holland, who's been instrumental in telling me about her experiences on CCNA and as a uh, candidate. CCNA is very important to the city, and it's very, been very important to me. Thank you. Thank you. Now I can begin. I apologize for that, sir. Uh, a significant part of this job is problem solving. Voters want to know who you are and how you go about solving problems that arise governing a city. So in your responses, please share the process and thinking you use to arrive at your answer. That's an important piece. So we'll start with that with the first question. Um, this is list the top neighborhood issue specific to your district and what you propose to resolve it. Mr. Shaw, if you could start, please. Very well, thank you. Um, the most important thing to my uh, district is affordable housing, attainable housing, and I say attainable and being workforce housing. In order to have workforce housing, you must also have a livable wage. So these things come in one, two, and of course, uh, the health of the community with it being, uh, with the COVID uh, pandemic that we are in today. Family, holding family together, keeping family together, building family. I'm very big on uh, rebuilding the walls of the city. And uh, in my district, we have to build integrity, respect, and uh, the decency that was once there. Did you want me to go further? You did. You have 10 seconds, sir. Very well. And my uh, problem solving comes with uh, the background material, staff, and I will also visit the sites in the area in which I'm dealing with for the most part. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you sir. Ms. Alpert, uh, you want me to read the question again? It's list the top neighborhood issues specific to your district and what you propose to resolve it. Please. Right now, the biggest issue in our district is hotel houses, and we just uh, voted on uh, a possible solution on last uh, our last commission meeting, where we um, took ideas from the neighborhood that suggested that we should do a registration of hotel houses, uh, a limit on the number of bedrooms, and a limit on the occupancy of the houses. So. You know, so that we don't become like Anna Marie Island, where it's just a prolifer proliferation of these large, giant houses that are built with seven bedrooms, seven bathrooms, and can house 20 or 30 people. I also want to meet with the neighborhood about an idea I have for a conservation historic 
district in that area, which I think also will be another tool to help. So in coming to decisions, I weigh the, um, I, I look at all of the issues, the background, um, listen to all sides, you know, talk to staff and get as much information as I can before I make a decision. Thanks. Thank you. Mr. Turner, uh, list the top neighborhood issues well, it's, uh, to, to your district. The top neighborhood issue okay. in my district is a top neighborhood issue in every district, and, and that's the, the current recession. Um, this recession is, is, is likely to be as bad, possibly worse than the Great Recession. It's important now that we develop a five-year financial strategic plan and based on that plan, uh, we need to develop a consensus on what are the essential services that have to be protected. And to begin now, early, to eliminate non-essential services, uh, to save our resources so that we can maintain essential services over the five-year plan. Currently, the commission is using optimistic revenue forecasts and relying on reserves to sustain unsustainable or to maintain unsustainable levels of, of spending. Um, and, and that is going to ultimately lead to a much more severe outcome for us and a much greater, much painful, more painful response to the, to the recession. We need to be looking forward now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Turner. Appreciate it. Mr. Arroyo, are you still with us? I am still here. And, uh, and that's a very loaded question, but I'll try to answer it for you uh, because, because even within the precinct, even within the neighborhoods, the needs are, are very, very different. Yes, opening up, opening, opening the economy, economy back up because of COVID is very important, um, especially with, with the fact that uh, we have an increasing amount, increasing rate of utilities going for the next, uh, the next 10 years. Uh, we need to make sure that we allocate funds for roads and drainage and safety to District 3. Uh, neighborhoods need access to the legacy trail expansion. But, but if I'm going to make one promise within the first 100 days, and, and, I, and I hope I have the backing of whoever gets elected, if I get elected and whoever else is, is in the commission, uh, within the first 100 days, I'd like to place a conservation easement over uh, the Bobby Jones uh, a golf course and park to make sure and hand it over to the Conservation Foundation and make sure that it, it doesn't get developed and it remains uh, open to the public. And that that's my promise within the first hundred days of getting elected. Uh, I, I, I believe that even though utility rates, affordable housing, getting a fair share and access to Legacy Trail are important, everybody in the neighborhood surrounding me agree on that. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Mr. Claremont, shall I read the question? It's a list of top neighborhood issues specific to your district and what you propose to re resolve it. Yeah, thank you. I think it's being prioritized. Um, district 3 gets forgotten a bit, um, uh, possibly understandably to an extent. We're not along the waterfront. It's not what draws the tourists. It's not where the money is. Uh, but when you walk around the district, when you drive around the district, um, you see the huge sidewalks, um, you see the flattened uh, speed bumps, uh, you see the cracked roads and uh, the, the, the uh, park that needs lighting and things of that nature and I, I think it does get forgotten a bit and people mention this to me repeatedly um, uh, about those issues in their neighborhoods and it, it can be dangerous um, as much walking as I do which is pretty constant almost every day uh, I have seen one police patrol in all this time um, we just get set aside and uh, I think bringing efforts back to to uh, I, don't, I don't think we've been represented well uh, especially so I think uh, the times between the agenda and the uh, the meeting will be about the city issues but between those issues beyond that will be about bringing attention back to our district thank you thank you you beat your time appreciate that uh, this is the second question what is an example of a completed project you consider quote smart smart growth and one which is not and we'll start with mr. Shaw and before we start um, this will be the sign for 10 seconds this will be it's time for your you're over your time. Thank you. Do it again. That's <laughs> You're over your time. Very good. Thank you. Uh, completed projects. Well, we put a dog park in Gillespie Park, which was very very much needed, and uh, we also took out uh, the pavilion in uh, Gillespie Park. That one worked very well to change the dynamics and the behavioral uh, 
actions that we were with having within uh, Gillespie Park. With smart growth, we have made very good uh, inroads in North Sarasota's uh, District One with both Rosemary and in uh, the 1912 Orange Avenue, I'm sorry, at Amarillo's uh, Park uh, place coming forward. Both have been very smart growth thinking, playing out uh, what we had to do. In Rosemary, we did um, density improvements and they have worked. Did get my time. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Alpert, I'll read the question again. What is an example of completed project to consider smart growth and one which is not? Please start. Well, I think, you know, during the five years that I've been on the commission, there have been actually a lot of things that have been completed. One of the most notable is that our downtown master plan was designed by um, Andres Duani, who is one of the gurus of smart growth. And so that plan is coming out of the ground. We've completed the mark, um, you know, 1350 Main and other projects that um, have made the downtown really, at least before the pandemic, a lot more vibrant where we were adding coffee shops and retail and restaurants. And I think that will all continue to come back as the economy starts opening up. Also, the, um, the roundabouts um those were you know they were put into place before i was on the commission but i'm a big supporter of those and those are smart growth principles thank you thank you mr turner yes um as has been alluded the duani plan is essentially a smart growth plan um, it was uh, approved by a commission even before uh, I was on the commission. Uh, a, a number of the projects that uh, have facilitated wide sidewalks and pedestrian uh, uh, comfort on the, on the, in the city streets um, are all smart growth. Uh, the roundabouts are one. Uh, the other that I would mention is a small project, but uh, we widened the sidewalk on Lower Main. Uh, sorry, on Lower Main, uh, went from on one side of the street from uh, diagonal parking, parallel parking, and allowed us to widen the sidewalks by uh, about eight feet. That's an example of smart growth. Uh, something that I would think is not consistent with smart growth, smart growth, and with the Duwani plan are the two condos that were allowed to be built on South Palm. Uh, they are right on the sidewalk. They are massive structures that overhang the sidewalk and make the uh, pedestrian experience pretty intimidating. One of the structures has a vertical concrete, plain concrete wall to almost 90 feet. Uh, so those would be my Thanks. examples. Oh, sorry, thank you. <laughs> David, please put your hand in your, sort of your middle. I didn't see it over on the corner. Thank you. Okay, I'll put it on your nose. <laughs> thank you. Uh, Mr. Arroyo, can you see me when I do this? I can yeah. see you. Okay, I'll do this now. Thank you. Please start. Uh, there are, are you're talking about completed projects that one that is uh, uh, smart growth and one that I believe is not very smart. Yeah. There are a lot of projects oh, yeah. that I don't think are very smart. First of all, uh, roundabouts that have been pr proposed on on shade and wood. There's a roundabout on Ringling which has a lion uh, statue statue on it. Um, that, that that's it, it's supposed to be a roundabout right there, right by Colorado and and and, uh, and shade, and it's it's just a terrible terrible job at a roundabout um, but i think the most the most prominent failed project is lift station 87 uh which is is you know just about 99 percent done now it, it costs 67 million dollars it was supposed to be done in 2012 it's not done and it's going to be done next month it was supposed to cost under nine million dollars and it's going to cost taxpayers 67 million dollars that is not smart growth i think uh, the duani plan like 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 some have said the mark i think is an example of, of smart growth and i think the proposed projects at midtown plaza is uh smart growth thank you mr claremont 
Yes, I would say uh, Smart Growth uh, positive uh, in the city has been the Rosemary District overlay. Now that's not in my district, but it's an example of something I think worked really well. We built a lot of units over there. What is it, about 1,200 units that had been allowed over there, some additional density. I spent a fair amount of time over there because I have a good friend who lives in one of those new projects. And uh, the project, I mean, I should say the the, uh, the uh, traffic is light despite all of that growth. Um, you know, that was a very blighted area and I think it's just terrific. It continues to grow. There are continues, continuing plans for affordable housing over there and I think that's terrific. Um, I'm gonna be a little bit dull here and uh, uh, echo what Terry had said. Uh, buildings Echelon and I forget the name of the other on South Palm. Um, the issue I have there is how close they are to one another. You have two buildings who are pretty beautiful, I think, on their own. The first one that was built with the arch top and all that, all of a sudden the next building came, encroached upon it, stood forward of it. And I think that's the kind of growth that I would say is not smart. I would like to see us address our setbacks. Thank you. Thank you. Next question. Uh, if you have a rebuttal to anybody's comments, now to request. Then we'll go on to question three. And which is what expertise or experience do you have that would enable you to make decisions involving land use? We'll start with Ms. Albert, please. Well, as I mentioned, um, I spent six years serving on the Architectural Review Commission up in Tampa. And um, I, I came on that commission as the citizen member. I didn't know anything about historic preservation preservation or architecture. But during that time, I was able to educate myself. I learned from the architects. I learned from the historic preservationists. I learned by going to all of the National Trust for Historic Preservation conventions where we learned about historic preservation and urban planning. So um, my, my time on that commission, plus my um, um, training as an attorney because I can read the land use um, statues and the ordinances and understand what they're saying. So, and five years of experience on the commission dealing with that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mr. Turner. Yes, uh, I served uh, on the board of the Nature Conservancy of Florida for nine years, which is an organization very concerned about land use. Um, I also served on the board of Thousand Friends of Florida, whose mission is to develop smart use regulations at the state level with a view to building better communities. I served on the Sarasota County Planning Commission for three years, and I served on the county environmentally sensitive lands acquisition program. Finally, I served on the city commission where I made uh, land use decisions over a four year period. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Arroyo, please. Uh, thank you, thank you. Um, I've, do, I've done a lot with the city and I can tell you about all the, the boards and, and, and committees and involved, all the involvement I've had in the city, but I think the most uh, prominent projects that come up is uh, in terms of dealing with the city and county, I, I represented a client in amending the county code to allow for a school uh, for special needs children to operate out of a, a church, which loses its status as being able to have Sunday school after a certain number of years. So we amended that. I represented nonprofits be, uh, in front of the city commission uh, to to allow them to have a charity event in, in their parking lot because uh, they're not allowed to, because that's that's just how the law is. Uh, I've represented small business owners before the city commission be, who, who've been harassed over, over uh, you know, some technicality somewhere. And, and I've, I've come before all the city commissioners and, and I've, I've, I've said my, my piece. And for the most part, I, I get along well with them and, and they they rule in my favor. I've also done a lot of transactions with the city attorney and, and I've been very, very familiar with the, with the city's process. And that that's what I bring to the table, just a history, a track record of, of making both sides come Thank together. You. Thank you. Mr. Arroyo. Mr. Claremont, please. Sure. Thank you. Uh, I was, I've was i been working basically for myself for the last 30 years and uh, you know, I've employed people, I've had to make a lot of decisions, but how does that translate itself into uh, uh, land use issues and so on? I did have experience as well uh, for a time working with a guy who built a house for me, uh, helping him uh, manage some projects, building homes himself. And you got used to dealing with the city at that time and whatever entity there was that uh, was uh, handling zoning and so forth and code. Um, also, I've owned myself, my wife and I, I should say, approximately 30 different properties. And in those cases, too, you are always looking 
around you when you're making a purchase, uh, the impact of what you're doing, the impact of what could happen around you, uh, that's very important. And uh, I have a stake in Sarasota. We moved here 10 years ago, but bought our first uh, property a year after that and, uh, and uh, have had those experiences. So uh, I also fought a group uh, who was trying to develop behind us uh, something uh, pretty garish uh, 15 years ago back when I was in Wisconsin. So I do have some experience dealing with these issues. Thank you. Mr. Shaw. And thank you so very much. I must thank uh, Ms. Pamela Navalini for the work that she did in getting involved with the Southwest Regional Planning Council. Here we come to land use with six counties, which gave me a broad experience of learning. We found, I have found that uh, one of my our better projects is the, the Palmer Ranch, which is for 30 years set the model for uh, the region in growth, um, bringing me to smaller projects such as the um, historical preservation overlay that was recently created and uh, to be followed shortly in other areas uh, throughout the state. Uh, these projects and this experience has helped me to work myself into what we have as a beautiful project and example being the Rosemary Overlay. Thank you so very much. Thank you, sir. Any rebuttal on this one? Okay, next question. Hotel houses have become an issue on the barrier islands. What solutions do you have to resolve the noise, parking, and garbage issues? We'll start with Mr. Turner. Um, yes, um, I think I think basically the hotel housing is illegal under our current code, and I think the city should take legal action to close the existing hotel houses. I think we need to increase nuisance ordinances and nuisance ordinance penalties to uh, to mitigate the problem that they're causing and we need to find ways to make sure uh, to adjust the code uh, to make sure that it's clear that these things cannot be built in the future but we basically it breaks down into two problems we have to close down the ones that are being built and we need to change the code and to stop permitting future uh, hotel houses to be built uh, the other thing we need to do is we need to lobby at the state level for, for state regulation to give cities and counties more latitude to protect our residents from the intrusion of outside capital and outside investors are, who are here not for our community, but are here for profit. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Arroyo, would you like me to read it again? The hotel houses have become no, an issue in the islands. So, uh, one thing I would do is I would amend the noise ordinance uh, and and enforce the current laws in place that prevent commercial activities in res residential neighborhoods. I'm in favor of accessory dwelling units, but we really don't want that concept to be taken out of control. And 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 that's how we get we get these hotel houses. So we need to be smart about uh, making sure that that uh, it's it's a primary home that uh, that uh, and that they don't build you know. A, a giant pool surrounded by eight units and call it a single family home. So so we need to walk a, a, a fine line there. Thank you. Mr. Claremont. No reason to, uh, no need to belabor this point here. I don't, I don't know that any of us want a six or seven bedroom or bath or and bath uh, building in their neighborhood or anywhere near us. Um, when we see those, and we see them all over, when we travel around, we have a son who's going to school up in Jacksonville, you see those and you think about the poor person who's sitting there with their two bedroom, one bath house and how they get drowned by these large structures. I don't think any of us are gonna be in favor of this. It is, as Terry mentioned, an, an issue about home rule versus state rule. Uh, are we gonna be able to legislate that, legislate that here locally? I sure hope we are because the people don't wanna see it, neither do I. Thank you. Mr. Shaw. Thank you so very much. Um, this has been one of the greatest pieces for the last seven years, um, starting with the Barry Islands and the poor examples that we saw in the Northern Barry Islands and as they come deeper south. I definitely am uh, against um, the 
super large dwellings being used, encroaching upon the neighborhoods, changing those dynamics, totally destroying the neighborhoods and um, going forward. This is gonna take a, quite a bit of redefining and re-establishing uh, codes and uh, zoning to do what we have to do. As Mr. Turner and Mr. Claremont both said, this is a home rule issue against state rule, and we definitely need to do it at the state level. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Ms. Alpert. Um, yeah, as Commissioner Shaw said, one of our problems is the preemption by the state legislature limiting how much that we can regulate these. And we did have this, our city attorney look into this issue and um, right now they are not illegal so um, under our code so there's nothing we can do about that currently um, that doesn't mean that there aren't things that we can do for instance this registration i think will help because there's got to be somebody that can be contacted 24 7 if there's issues going on we need to rewrite our sound ordinance which is what we're working on so that it's easier to um, enforce that so we need to enforce our codes we need to make the changes that we can to make it more difficult for these uh, big houses to operate i am not in favor of them you know, and I'm in favor of doing whatever we can to limit um, their disruption on our neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Rebuttal? Yes, please. Mr. Uh, have you acknowledged me, David? Yes. Okay. Um, I believe the hotel houses are illegal. Uh, a structure with six buildings is per se not illegal, but they are being operated as hotels, not as single family residents. Ultimately, it's a question for the courts to decide, but the city should aggressively pursue the closure of these operations by taking these people to court. Um, I also think that the sound ordinance, thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, question number five. In light of Black Lives Matter movement, what recommendations do you have for the SPD leadership? We'll start with Mr. Arroyo, please. Oh, well, this is something we've spoken about practically in every single forum so far. And, and uh, I, I think all my, all my fellow candidates join me in saying that we're not going to defund the police. That's something we're not going to do, but we will, we will uh, provide more accountability. We'll, we'll hire strong leadership. We'll provide them with the best equipment they can. We'll continue to train, 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 we will uh, make sure that we, um, you know, make sure that we we hire a diverse a diverse police force and and ensure that uh, we keep our promises to them, which is you know make sure that that the pension is adequately funded as as they're entitled to. I, I think that's how we move move uh, <clears throat> past that because there are issues in other municipalities across the country, but I don't think Sarasota has has a, a serious problem. Um, like what we see being uh, portrayed in the national news. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Claremont, it's your turn. Thank you. Yeah, I'm endorsed by the local Sarasota Police Union and the International Union of Police Associations, and so I stand with the police. However, that is not to say that there aren't issues that uh, we, we can't address. Uh, obviously, uh, there have been issues nationally, and there have been the occasional issues locally, as there have been in many police uh, uh, in, any, in many communities. And uh, I think uh, it's an issue of outreach. Uh, we have to outreach ourselves to, to, to the police department. We have to speak to individual police officers and groups, ask them about their morale issues. Uh, what is their review of Chief, Chief DePino? Uh, we have to look at that because morale is a big issue uh, when they're out on the street every day, uh, when they're being pilloried in the press and um, you know, they're being hollered at and they're being demeaned as, and when they're professionals. I think that uh, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a kickback to that. We also have to have police outreach to the community, especially when, within the schools, I think. Uh, when police are in, in a very favorable, non-aggressive uh, way uh, in the police, I mean, in the schools, I think that leads to a better relationship, particularly in minority communities, uh, but across the city. I think it's just a positive thing that we need to do. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Shaw. Thank you so very much for this. Thank you, sir, for this opportunity. And so much work has been done in the last nine years with SPD 
and the minority community of uh, Sarasota. Uh, we created, uh, through Chief Tupino and others, work with our drug market intervention process. We brought in the, the high point strategy. We are looking at the involvement of uh, law enforcement in a greater manner within the community. We just had two uh, episodes in North Sarasota where SPD performed extremely well in the community uh, involvement. One was a uh, hostage holding um, issue where law enforcement worked well with the community and for the first fatality that we had we worked very well with local law enforcement. We are growing through sensitivity training. And I thank you. Hopefully I can come back to this one. Please put that down. Thank you, sir. Ms. Alpert. Um, yeah, I actually had a really long conversation with Deputy Chief Robinson um, about what's going on with the police department and some of the things that could be done. And as everybody said, none of us here are for defunding the police. Um, and our local police department, I think, has reacted really well with the, with the recent protests that we had in the city. Um, our police officers actually took a knee with the Black Lives Matter group, and we didn't have any violence in our city because I think our police department handled it um, with compassion and with um, professionalism. We have instituted um, something called Eight Can't Wait, which are eight principles to deal with um, um, eliminating and cutting down on use of excessive force. Um, we are doing community policing. Um, recently, we instituted a community action team. So I think we're doing a lot in the city and we're uh, getting them some body cams, so. Thank you, thank you. Mr. Turner. Yes, um, the notion of defunding the police is unacceptable. Uh, civilized society cannot exist without an effective police department. Uh, the notion of reimagining police is also not an acceptable alternative. In 2010 and 2011, the city commission instituted a number of reforms, including the creation of the police advisory board, the creation of a police complaints board, and a move toward community policing. Um, that basically set in place an infrastructure that allowed for a progressive police department to evolve. Our police department is evolving and changing constantly. It is a very good department. Uh, I'm very pleased with what they do. Uh, I give as an example of the evolution. We did in fact have a knee on neck policy that it was permissible and then when it became clear that it was not best practice, Chief Pepino immediately issued a directive that it was no longer policy and no longer permitted. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any rebuttal? Anybody? Okay, we'll move on to the next one. Question six. Sarasota prides itself as a city of the arts and culture. In light of COVID and budget constraints, how would you keep the arts alive in Sarasota? We'll start with Mr. Claremont. Sure, thank you. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, we, we can't really, the city in, with the financial struggles that we are entering into are going to be able to help with a, maybe a financial program. What I think that what we can do is encourage the arts and cultural organizations to bring their talent out uh, into the streets and the parks and have the city uh, help with uh, gain approval for doing that type of thing. I think it, we've had a dark year. We've had a dark year just across the board. I don't need to list what all those items are. I think it would be terrific if the city would promote our organizations here by encouraging them to come out, bring some joy to the city and let our performers perform. Um, after all, that's what performers want to do. They want to get out and perform. And I think that'd be terrific to see them on a closed down Main Street on a Friday or Saturday night. I'd like to see them in Arlington Park. I know the county has a, a flatbed trailer that's convertible into a performance venue. Uh, I think we could bring that around. It would, it would spread that joy and it would uh, bring maybe a new, uh, new group of people to the arts uh, that maybe otherwise wouldn't have attended. And uh, it would be maybe free performances, maybe pass the hat. Uh, I think that would be a positive thing in the city. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Shaw, you're up. Thank you so very much. Uh, I have to agree with the uh, involvement of our cultural arts 
uh, within the community itself, moving it into an open air venue is very much a, a um, need and necessary. With our arts and uh, our culture, moving um, these venues throughout the city is very important. A, a, a first Friday in um, MLK Park, for instance, is very much necessary. It draws both uh, people and uh, cultures together. Uh, it involves and invites people into areas of the city that we normally wouldn't go. And so moving these uh, adventures throughout the city would be most beneficial in exchanging relations amongst ourselves. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Ms. Alpert. Well, some of the previous speakers uh, talked about some of the things that um, I was going to mention as well. I think we have to work with the cultural arts and cultural uh, venues to help them uh, find spaces to do performances outside in our parks, uh, in their parking lots. I think we're working with the West Coast Black Theater right now to um, get some permitting so they can do some performances in their parking lot. Um, I think we need to help them as they start to come back now by promoting the events that they have. And I also believe that we need to help them to be able to um, um, uh, plan for and expand on their venues when they need to, um, to accommodate the growth in our community, because if they're not able to grow, they're going to have to move to other areas. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Turner. Yes, uh, my wife and I are personally uh, supporters of the arts. So we, uh, we often go to the theater, the opera, and the ballet. Um, when I was on the commission previously, I played a lead role in reducing the city bureaucracy, which was uh, stifling the Van Wezel, and, and, and it allowed Mayor Benzel to do a much better job. I took the lead on providing uh, streetscapes and infrastructure supports that the Florida Studio Theater needed to expand uh, its, its operation. And I served on the Tourist Development Council and constantly lobbied uh, for increased allocations to the Arts Alliance. Uh, that said, we're all suffering equally. The arts are suffering and the city's suffering. Uh, we're going to see a continued decline in revenue and they need revenue. Uh, as, a, as a future city commissioner, I will uh, lobby to be on the Tourist Development Council and shift funding from sports tourism, which the county is fixated on, to arts and, uh, arts and culture uh, support. And thank you, David. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Mr. Arroyo. Uh, thank you, thank you. Yeah, we actually just had that forum on, on arts, on the arts and, and cultural uh, council this week. Um, I, I think we should just focus on, on developing the city in a smart way. Uh, there, there's very little that the city can do directly, but indirectly we can focus on walkability. We can, we can make sure that we don't hinder tourism. We can allocate economic development corporation uh, funds to, to, to the arts to ensure that they, they bring the jobs that focus on the arts and, and cultural diversity. We can al allocate the tourist tax funds intelligently, that we don't have a closed door policy that drives institutions like the Players Theater and Thunder by the Bay and, and the orchestra and Selby out of the city. We need to have a welcoming policy that, that, that that makes these organizations feel at home and so that they can flourish. And that's the policy that we need to adopt. Thank you. Thank you. Any rebuttal? Okay, we'll move on to the next one. Question seven. What do you think it will take to foster a more constructive and collegial city commission? We'll start with Mr. Shaw. <laughs> um, I, I, I think engagement, um, in those uh, organizations such as the Florida League of Cities that brings um, commissioners and elected officials from throughout the city to uh, throughout the state together and uh, to learn um, of the role of an elected official would be far more uh, important if 
all of us participated. Not everybody participates in these. Um, there are 60, 412 cities and municipalities who learn from each other through uh, engagement and coming together, working with each other on regional problems that become state problems. The very conversation that we had earlier on uh, the hotel homes or short-term rentals were taken at a state level and commissioners learn to work together and talk together, speaking back and forth, if that helps. Thank, Thank you, sir. Ms. Albert. Well, I think the commission needs to follow the code of public conduct that we all <laughs> expect the <laughs> public to follow. So I think that's that's certainly <laughs> a start. But I, I think what uh, Commissioner Shaw said is um, an excellent idea is that, you know, sort of getting more involved in the Florida League of Cities and learning about the role of a commissioner and just remembering that, um, you know, we can't really talk outside of the commission meetings. So sometimes these issues are very passionate and so sometimes uh, people can get heated, but I think, you know, we have, we have to learn not to do that. And I think we just have to learn to be respectful of other people's opinions, even if they don't agree with our own. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Turner. Yeah, uh, the, the, Cal uh, the Florida Sunshine Laws uh, make it difficult to establish collegial relationships with your colleagues, but it's important to recognize that that barrier means we all have to work much harder. We have to foster mutual trust and respect, and we have to listen to our colleagues. And I don't just mean, you know, some people think listening means being quiet while the other person talks. Listening means listening and hearing, taking in what the person says, responding to what they say, and respect what they say. Uh, so many people do not have that skill. Uh, and the other thing is that when you make your case uh, and your colleagues decide to vote another way, you have to accept that loss gracefully, uh, graciously. You have to understand that different points of view uh, are all important and yours won't always prevail. And when yours does not prevail, one must not throw a tantrum. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Mr. Arroyo, please. Thank you for that question because whoever gets, this election is so important that whoever gets elected, uh, all, the, all the commissioners will have to appoint uh, two representatives to amend the charter. Uh, so this, this upcoming commission will be very, very, very impactful. First, I think the fact that the commissioners receive all their information from the city manager uh, one at a time is, is a big problem. Commissioners don't talk to each other. They only talk to the city manager individually outside of outside of Sunshine. Everything else is subject to Sunshine. So we have to make sure that, uh, you know, that the commissioners are talking to each other. Well, if I get elected, I'm, I'm going to implement a Sunday. Sunday, it, it could be a coffee, tea, informal. We'll notice it. We'll make it compliant with Sunshine. But the commissioners need to talk to each other. I feel like that is the the biggest the biggest uh, hurdle that I see. There's a, there's the, the messages are kind of getting mixed up. Also, uh, like like some uh, like uh, Commissioner Alpert said, make sure that although there are many different opinion differing opinions, only one voice emerges out of the commission. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Claremont, sir. Yes, this is a big issue. I mean, I'll, I'll commit right now to civility and uh, respect. And respect is a big word. When you're ever you have a relationship with anybody, whether it's at work, whether it's at home, it's about respect. We have to, I, I think, as commissioners, when uh, when there's disrespect going on, you're not only disrespecting another commissioner, you are disrespecting the people who voted for that person. They 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 won the election in their district or in an at large election. And I, I see that happening, and I just think, how? what is the reaction of the people? We are representatives of the people. We're all working very hard here. We're all taking it. This is a part-time job. If you win this race, even if you don't, I have a great deal of respect for you just for having gone through this process. This isn't a place where you get rich. This is a place where you give back. If a person is willing to do that, whether I disagree with you or not, I will respect your opinion. I will listen to it, and I'll consider it. 
Thank you. The next four questions are a nice yes or no response. And we'll start with Mr. Shaw on this question. As commissioner, would you be in favor of having accessory dwelling units be allowed in single family zone neighborhoods using the affordable thresh of affordability threshold of one times the AMI, 1.0 times the AMI? It's yes. a yes or no question. Yes. Okay. Ms. Alpert? Yes. Okay. Mr. Turner? No, but I'd be willing to study the issue further. Okay. Mr. Arroyo? Yes, but AMI needs to be relooked at. Mr. Claremont? Yes, with restrictions. Okay. Next question. As commissioner, would you support funding for a parks district separate from the city general fund? Starting with Ms. Alpert. Yes, I already have supported that. Okay. It's a yes or no, please. If we could all stick to that. Mr. Turner. No. Mr. Arroyo. No. Mr. Claremont. No. And Mr. Shaw. Yes. Okay. Next one. As commissioner, would you support an easement agreement for keeping the Bobby Jones property a public conservation land in perpetuity? Mr. Turner? Yes. Mr. Arroyo? A resounding yes. Mr. Claremont? Absolutely. Mr. Shaw? Yes. Ms. Alpert? Yes. Okay. Number four. As commissioner, would you support matching funds with the county for the Bay Park project as proposed in the TIF district agreement? So with Mr. Arroyo? Uh, no opinion as of right now, but leaning towards yes. Okay. Mr. Claremont? Yes. Mr. Shaw? Yes. Ms. Alpert? Um. The, the current TIF agreement, I just want a clarification on the question. The, the one that we're working on now, is that what yes. you're asking? Okay, yes. It is. Mr. Turner. Yes, with significant provisions for controlling financial risk. Yes or no, sorry. Okay, thank you. And this, this is gonna be a district specific. The next set of questions will be proposed, will be posed to each set of candidates for a district. Each question is unique to that district and you'll have one minute to answer with no rebuttal possibility. District one, Mr. Shaw, cite a neighborhood in your district and share one idea for balancing growth while maintaining neighborhood character. Mm. I think that I would still yet work towards a uh, affordable housing project that would bring about uh, controlled growth in, in doing so with uh, mobility being one of the main things there to maintain and retain characters such as creating merch that would be bring about greater connectivity of our neighborhoods that would bring us to um, bike paths and the nature of greater walkability. So I would be at uh, devising and containing and retaining the identity of our neighborhoods as they are going forward. Thank you. Thank you. District two question. We'll start with Ms. Albert. Do you support the planning board decision this week to support the Selby Gardens plan and why? Well, I do support the planning board's decision. Um, as probably all of you know, I was on record in supporting the um, first Selby Gardens plan. I think that they've done a terrific job in looking at how to make improvements to the traffic flow on that intersection. That gives us the opportunity that wouldn't come for years to make improvements there. Um, it frees up more green space and allows for that property to continue to be a botanical garden and protects the um, 
protects the collections that are there, I think we're going to be really happy that that plan gets implemented. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Turner? Um, before I can answer that question, no, I can answer the question. I want to see the traffic study. I want to understand their proposal for noise control. And I want to understand what in their master plan they plan to do that supports a 450 car parking garage. At this point, uh, I need to un understand those questions before I could support the planning board's decision. Thank you. You done? Uh, District three, knowing that the Bath and Racket Club project will be resubmitted to the planning board, what would you make this project, what would make this project acceptable to you? And we'll start with Mr. Arroyo. Bath and Racket is not in District three. Uh oh. <laughs> well, let's answer it. Happy to talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, that that's another one where I would I, I'm still open to new information. I have not formulated an opinion. Okay, thank you, Mr. Claremont. Sure. I mean, this is a situation where I think um, with, with any of these projects that we've had over the last several years that have been controversial, uh, it's working with the neighborhoods up front. Now there was significant effort to do so by Sweet Sparkman and by the ownership there, and I think there was a lot of. Uh, I think it was a pretty good plan the first time around. What has to happen here is we just have to look at the walkability of that of that area. We have to look at the water, uh, the, the way the uh, water runoff works, and we have to take into account the fact that a lot of people want to live here, and there's going to be a bit of density. There was, uh, I think, the proposal was for 25 units per acre there. Um, I've got 25 units per acre on the next block to me. Um, I don't think it's overly onerous um, to the neighborhood, but then I don't live there. So that's why you have to uh, work with them on screening. You have to work with them on setbacks. It, it's just a matter of working hand in hand and letting them know what needs to be accomplished in the city as well as with their neighborhood. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, we're, we're now uh, at the conclusion. And uh, we want one minute closing statement from each of you. And this time I'll begin with you, Mr. Claremont, please. You say Mr. Claremont? Yes, okay. Yeah, I think that one of the uh, challenges that we have in the city is a lack of planning along our corridors. We haven't really looked at our comp plan and the overall zoning in the city for about 20 years. And as the city has grown, uh, the area around it has grown exponentially. And there's just been a lack of planning and looking ahead at land use uh, along the corridors. Uh, I think we can enhance the neighborhoods within if we have um, a better game plan. We have uh, the Cabana Inn, for instance, in District 3, it makes a lot of noise. What is the plan there? We have, uh, we have doctor's offices that are growing and need parking around it. What's the plan there? It has people driving around, parking in the streets, the neighbors don't like it. We just haven't planned sufficiently. Planning is the word. We went 10 years without a certified planner, a trained planner in the city. We now have one. Mr. Colbert's doing a great job, but we need more efforts in that regard. And I think uh, rezoning certain areas of the city, particularly in District 3 along our corridors, is very important. And I want to thank CCNA for this forum. Thank you. Mr. Arroyo, same question. Um, thank you. Thank you for CCNA for... For, for hosting us. Uh, we've I've been to CCNA many, many times and I've met many of the, the leaders there. I think it's important to have a track record. I have a track record of working along both sides of the aisle with pro-development and, 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 and you know, anti-development anti groups. I have the, the privilege of growing up in Sarasota. I've seen the city change. I've changed with the city and I've grown with the city. I've grown with the district. I understand the struggles of the people in the district, and I think that's important. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm committed to spending the rest of my life here. I love Sarasota. My family is here, and, I'm, and I'm, uh, the new addition of my family will, will, will surely, uh, you know, go to school here in Sarasota. Um, I think all that is important because it, it, it shows loyalty to the city. It shows knowledge and commitment to the issues that we're trying to address here. Vote for Eric Arroyo, November third. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Turner. Um, in 2011, developers took and consolidated control of the county commission. We know how that worked out. In 2017, developers got a working majority on the city commission. 
We know how that's working out. In this election, developers are trying to protect their working majority on the commission, and they are trying to elect candidates who will put, for the fifth time, an elected mayor question on the ballot. An elected mayor will surely lead to developer control of our city. We know how that will work out. Is that what you want? It's not what I want. I'm Terry Turner. I ask for your vote, and I thank you for listening. Thank you, sir. Ms. Alpert. Thank you. When I ran five years ago, I wanted to bring the Bayfront 2020 vision to completion, help resolve our homeless problem, and implement smart growth in our community. The Bay Project is well on its way. The homeless count has been reduced at least 60%, and smart growth is occurring in our community. I'm running a second time because I want to continue that planning and forward movement of planning for smart multimodal transportation systems, planning for sea level rise and sustainability, planning the creation of a world-class park system, planning how we retain our historic and cultural assets. And I've been working on these issues for the past five years. We've made significant progress, but there's still more to do. I'm asking for your vote so that I can continue my work for you and with you. Please go to votelizalbert.com and join my campaign for a safer, smarter, sustainable Sarasota. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you, Ms. Al. Mr. Shaw. Thank you so Please. very much. I only wish my opponent was here today because uh, so much. I'm here longer than all of you put together in time. And I have seen such great growth within our city, but with controlled growth within our city, we get a better uh, city. And inclusiveness, bringing all of our community together in, its, uh, in this growth process is necessary. Not pieces, not parts, but all at uh, the same time. I'm very much for the inclusion of uh, Sarasota itself. So much of our uh, workforce comes from outside of the community. And I would love to maintain, retain, and sustain uh, the local uh, persons of this community. As our constituents, Sarasota belongs to Sarasotans. Thank you. Vote for Willie Charles Shaw, Commissioner, District 1. And thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, sir. Well, this concludes our forum for candidates running for the City of Sarasota Commission. Thanks to all the candidates, their teams, and to all of you who took time to be part of this forum. A special thanks to Sue Stewart, without whom we would never have been here. It would be still trying to figure out how to turn the computers on. So the most important thing is please plan to vote before or on November 3rd. A lot depends on it. So thank you all, and uh, have a good afternoon. Bye now. Thank, Thank you. you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you.